Amen, amen. Good morning. Giving honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is first in my life, it gives me great honor and privilege to be able to stand before you in the house of the Lord just one more time. Amen? Amen. Bless the Lord at all times. May God's praise be continuously in my mouth. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt the name of the Lord together. Seek the Lord and be filled, for those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Happy are those who find refuge in God. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now, Father, just thanking you once again for allowing us to see another day. Lord, we thank you for waking us up this morning, clothing our right minds, Father, and for you giving us a place to come and lift up your name and praise without fear of persecution. Father, we ask right now that you just bless everyone here in this household of faith, Father, and you bless those that had the desire to come but are not able to be here. Father, we ask right now that everything be done today in decency and order and that you get all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. For all these things we ask and count it done in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus knows our every weakness and loves us still. Awaken to the promises of Christ's amazing grace. The psalm writer wrote in the 103rd division of Psalms, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He have not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as to the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we all forgive him. Amen. Amen. Once again, we want to uh, welcome everyone here to Beulah Presbyterian Church, and we also want to uh, welcome all those who may be out there uh, watching us by way of social media. Um, this morning, uh, I'm going to give you uh, our scriptural text, and then I'm going to uh, let a selection play. But um, this morning, our text uh, will be coming from, and once again, we're going back to the book of James, Chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 14. Again, that is the book of James, chapter 1, and verse 14. And so, uh, as I sit back and just sup with the Lord for a little while, I hope that you enjoy this selection. Amen? Amen.
we need is for the Lord to help us to hold out. Because every day is a trying times and trying situations. But um, again, you know, I, I'm very thankful uh, last week for uh, Reverend Ferguson's message uh, because it was uh, definitely a right on time message. Uh, and it kind of feeds right into uh, what we've been talking about lately as far as when we're looking at the book of James. Uh, because um, James was talking about, um, in this particular passage, he was talking about uh, how we face temptations all the time. And uh, sometimes we don't always get things right when we want to... Um, uh, make proclamations you know uh that's why he was telling people that uh you can't say that you was tempted by the lord um so uh as you can see uh, the lord is definitely keeping me on this same path and once again uh this morning our message is coming from the book of james chapter 1 verse 14 and the word of the lord is read as thus but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Again, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. You know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we talked about how uh, people will forge God's name on checks that he did not write and refuse to own up to their own mess. And we know that people do this kind of thing all the time because if they didn't, James would not have said, let no one say when he is tempted that I am tempted by God. You see, we already know that God does not tempt us to do anything. But our text says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. You see, as I studied for this text, it kind of uh, reminded me last night, uh, I, as I was sitting there thinking about it, uh, I kind of had this flashback. Uh, back when I first started cutting hair, uh, I worked at this shop in Winston-Salem, and it was this, uh, and y'all may remember me saying something about this old preacher man named Johnny Kirkland. But uh, this old preacher man uh, that would come in the shop, uh, he would come there to get his haircuts, but he also bought this young lady with him who had these two little boys, and they were about uh, maybe seven and eight years old, but they were brothers. And what he would do was uh, he would always try to help the young lady out by providing those young men with uh, some spiritual guidance. Um, I don't know where their father was in their lives, but he was kind of filling in for the, uh, the male role model in the family. But like I said, he continued to... Uh, try to help them out with spiritual advice. But one day, those two little boys got in trouble at school and he wound up having to take that mother up there to the school to pick her kids up. So after he picked the kids up, uh, he dropped her off and he brought the little boys back down to the barber shop. And so uh, he decided that uh, while they out, they all might as well get a haircut. But uh, while they were sitting there waiting and all of us were busy cutting hair, he proceeded to tell us what these little boys did in school and how they got in trouble. And he uh, was, as he was telling us what they had done, we saw him opening up his Bible because we could tell he was getting ready to give them a good tongue lash in using the word. But he turned and he looked at the little boy and he asked him, he said, now what made you do that? The little boy looked up at him and said, the devil made me do it. We all busted out laughing because it was funny. So the preacher man, after he said that to him, he just kind of turned his head up towards the sky. He closed his Bible, he crossed his legs, and he couldn't say a word. <laughs> but we laughed hysterically uh, at what the little boy had said. But I say all of this to say that we can't always point the finger at the devil either. You see, because these little boys had been in this predicament before, and I'm talking about being in trouble and being in a hot seat, they knew exactly what to say to get the preacher man uh, off their back in order to save them from the pains of uh, having to hear and endure this chastisement. So even as children, uh, uh, we know how to shift blame in order to save ourselves 
from uncomfortable situations. But we all know about the devil and what he's capable of doing. You see, the Bible tells us that he is an adversary because he works against God's plan for humanity. It tells us that he is a liar because the truth ain't in him. It tells us that he is a tempter because he's always trying to get people to do the very things that God told us not to. It tells us that he is the author of confusion because he messes with people until they don't know which way is up, which way is down, or what's right or wrong. And, he, uh, and even though it also refers to him as the ruler of darkness of this age, he is still powerless against us. And he has no authority over our lives unless we yield to him. You see, first of all, he still has to have permission of God just to mess with one of the children of God. And secondly, all he ever does is throw temptations at us. But whether or not we choose to indulge in those temptations is completely up to us. And this brings me to the title of my message. What looks good to you ain't always good for you. What looks good to you ain't always good for you. May we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now, Father. Thanking you once again for allowing us to come together to lift up your name and praise. As I sit down, you stand up. Hide me behind the cross. Father, first of all, just let this word go out and be planted in our hearts, Father. And you water it and give it the increase. Help us to understand, Father, that these things that we do, they are us. They are in us. And we have to struggle and fight every day not to do these things. But, Father, we ask right now that this word helps us to own our mess, repent of it, and turn back to you. For these things we ask and count it done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What looks good to you ain't always good for you. You see, as we continue to look at James, uh, uh, we're going to dissect this text this morning. James says, but each one is tempted. Now, we're, we're going to stop right there because James makes it clear that everyone will be tempted. That means that we, the children of God, and all those who are out there in the world will be enticed to do sinful and wicked things. The kind of things that if we would just think about it for a moment are not really beneficial to us. As a matter of fact, any benefits that they yield will not last. You see, falling victim to temptations is not something that just happens it doesn't just happen overnight. It's a process. It's a cycle. And it takes about, uh, there's four stages to temptation. You see, first you have desire. Then you have enticement. Thirdly, you have conception. And last but not least, death. You see, desire is when the craving hits. And we've all had a craving for something, even if it's just a piece of chocolate. But it's when the craving hits. Enticement is when the craving is triggered and goes into overdrive. So we can go to the grocery store. Now, we've been craving this piece of chocolate. We can go to the grocery store and all we're going to get is some hamburger, uh, uh, some spaghetti sauce, and, and, and some spaghetti. But when we get up to that checkout line and we look over there and we see that chocolate, guess what? We got to have it. But we're going to talk about these two things a little bit later uh, in the message, desire and enticement. But then you have conception. Conception is, uh, uh, is when those thoughts become action. So now that you grab this piece of chocolate, you have conceptualized it. You have moved on it. But see, this is the stage where choices, the choices that we make are very important. Uh, they're the difference between whether or not we pass or fail the test. And then last but not least, you have death. Death is when the deed is done. The sin has been committed. And all that is left is all the hurt, the pain, the guilt, and all of the sorrow. All of the things that come as a consequence to sin. At this point, the only thing that is left to do is, is for you to own it. Confess it, repent of it, and make it right with all those who are affected by it and get right with God. 
So when temptations come upon us, we need to remember that as children of God, these moments are for the perfecting of our faith. But for all those who are out there in the world, it is either going to be the thing that keeps them in the clutches of the devil or the very thing that makes them cry out, Lord, what must I do to be saved? But the text says, but each one is tempted when he, we're going to stop right there. Now the word when is indicative of time. We may not know when the time will come, but what we do know is that it is coming. The Bible tells us that each and every last one of us will face periods of adversity as trials and tribulations or the tests and temptations in our lives. These are the very things that help increase uh, perseverance, character, and hope. Then the word he is indicative of both men and women here in the text. Because back in biblical days, grammatically, they spoke using masculine pronouns to refer to both sexes. But the text once again says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away. Now the question is, drawn away from what and by who? Well, we are drawn away from the beaten path, drawn away from righteousness, drawn away from the things of God, and drawn away from God himself. And this is exactly what the devil wants, because uh, the last thing he wants anybody to do is to get closer to the Lord. So what he does is he starts digging around in his bag of tricks, and he starts throwing any and everything he's got at us to keep us from looking to the Lord. But as far as him being able to draw us away, it's not that simple. You see, once again, he has no power over us because we are children of God. And if we get off a track, it's usually a result of a choice that we made. John warns us that uh, Satan has only one offensive playbook with three distinctive plays numerous obstacles, and a diverse group of players. John said, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So the world is his playbook. People are the players. The things of the world are the obstacles. And uh, his plays are what we want, what we see, and how we feel about ourselves and others. You see, what we want is the lust of the flesh. What we see is the lust of the eyes. And how we feel about others and ourselves is the pride of life. The lust of the flesh is everything that appeals to the carnal and physical appetite. Although natural, and I stress the word natural, these desires are not inherently evil. But the devil can still use these permissible uh, things uh, to uh, uh, increase uh, forbidden desires and carnal behaviors which can enslave people. So when we say inherently evil, uh, the lust of the flesh are things like the need for food, for drink, and for sexual fulfillment. But in the hands of the devil, the need for food can turn into gluttony. The need for drink can turn into alcoholism. And the need for sexual fulfillment can turn into adultery, fornication, homosexuality, and any other sexual sin that you can think of. Then you have the lust of the eyes. This is everything that appeals to the eyes' insatiable demands. So what happens is Satan will use external attractions whether they are inherently good, like a house or a car, or inherently bad, like somebody else's wife, in order to ignite covetousness in someone. Then you have the pride of life. And this is everything that appeals to haughtiness, arrogance, and pride. And this type of temptation uh, is where uh, Satan uses one's personal achievements to produce an, an art an article self-sufficient attitude and when people fall victim to the pride of life it is no longer a battle against the flesh because the wicked one has already won the sensual and intellectual battle in one's mind 
So these are things like popularity and uh, academic successes. Now, what I want you to understand is that this is different from people who give all the credit of their success to God. You see, right now, we got a president up there that thinks he's the only one doing what he's doing. But as you can see, the devil makes the most of his resources, and he's good at what he does. You see, when he was God's chief angel, he became prideful and led an insurrection against God. But he didn't do it alone. He managed to persuade a third of the angels to rise up against God, the creator himself. Then after being dealt with and cast out of heaven, there came another issue where the sons of God started mating with the daughters of men. And the thing is, the Bible doesn't say so, but something or someone had to put it in their minds for them to do what they did. And all throughout the Old Testament, the devil uh, influences mankind to do some very horrible things. That's why we see moments where the children of Israel would do uh, pretty good for a little while, and then they would get caught up and take on the ways of all those around them. You see, this is why you have to be careful about the company you keep. And we know that the Bible tells us that bad company will corrupt good behavior. And the children of Israel in the Old Testament are a prime example of that. But in the New Testament, uh, if we were to look at the life of Christ, you can see how the devil was working hard to try and trip him up. We also see uh, how he darkened the understanding of the Sadducees, Pharisees, and the scribes and used them to crucify Christ. So like I said, the devil has always been busy. But back to the text, it says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Now, this is another one of those situations where the English translations rob people of important spiritual understanding. You see, a lot of people uh, have never made the connection between desires and enticements and how they work hand in hand. You see, Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines desires as a conscious impulse towards something that promises enjoyment or satisfaction in its attainment. While entice means to attract artfully or skillfully by arousing hope or desire. And then in parentheses it says to tempt. But from a biblical standpoint, the Greek word for desire is epithemia which comes from the root word epithemos. Epi meaning focused on and thamos meaning passionate feelings. And in the Bible, in most cases, this is often referred to as evil desires. But it's a passion built on strong feelings or urges, which can be positive or negative depending on whether or not the desire is for or inspired by God. But in this, our scriptural text, we know that it is referring to desires in a negative way. Because we already know from verse 13 that it says God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Now, the Greek word for enticed is deleho, which derives from the Greek word delere, which means bait. So it means to allure, deceive, bait a hook, or set a trap with bait for the victim by using their own selfish impulses against them. So after clearing up these linguistical disparities, the verse could easily read like this. Every man is lured away by his own negative passions or urges and trapped by his own selfish impulses. So this has nothing to do with the devil. And we certainly know that God's hands is clean of any temptation. You see, it's us. It's, we are the ones to blame. The Bible makes it clear that we are born in sin and wrapped in iniquity. So sin is something that is ingrained within us. It's in our DNA. And just because we are saved and washed in the blood, it does not mean that we are impervious to messing up. As a matter of fact, the devil punches a whole lot harder when you're a child of God. Yes. Yes. But we're all just alike, but yet we are still so very different. You see, on one hand, we all uh, have a desire for something, 
But on the other hand, what appeals to you may not appeal to me. But the common denominator is Satan will just keep right on messing with us until he finds out what our weakness is. You see, like I said, everybody has a desire. So you're either going to desire God or you're going to desire the things of the world. But everybody has some type of desire. You see, in a way what the devil does is kind of like fishing. You see, he just keeps on baiting hooks and he keeps uh, throwing them out there to see if he can get us hooked on. And when this bait doesn't work, guess what? He'll try something else. See, for some people, that bait might be uh, money and prestige. For others, it might be uh, fame and power. For some people, it might be drugs or alcohol. For some, it's that certain man or that certain woman. And then again, it could be uh, uh, that job, that car, or that house that you always wanted. Because we just, uh, uh, when we looked at the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, uh, we saw how the devil can take those inherently good things and use them to spark covetous in us. But the thing is, is that the devil never stops trying. The thing is, is we already know that we live in a world that is saturated with sin. Because John tells us that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And for this reason, Paul tells us that we are not ignorant of his devices. And when he says his, he's talking about Satan. That is why he turned around and he told the church of Ephesus, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Then he goes on to tell us how we should gird our loins with truth because truth is what holds it all together. It's not our truth, but it's God's truth. Then he tells us to put on the breastplate of righteousness and this is to guard our heart because the devil will attack both our minds and our hearts because they are the weakest point. Then he says, shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And that means that we're supposed to be ready whenever and wherever we go to always give a defense for the uh, joy that we have. And then he said, take up the shield of faith and this is to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. He said, place upon your heads the helmet of salvation. And this is to guard our minds because the word says, uh, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. And then he said, take up the sword of the spirit, which is God's holy word, which is like a two-edged sword which cuts both ways. It is good for uh, uh, the uh, reproofing, correcting, and, and, and teaching of God's statutes. And then he said, pray always. With all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. But thank God that we have Jesus Christ. Who is not only our savior but a walking and talking example of how we are supposed to live. And as we model ourselves after him and we grow in the perfecting of our faith, and that is the knowledge and wisdom of Jesus Christ, progressive sanctification, let us remember that as we deal with the troubles of this old world and its daily attractions and distractions, there are just a few things that we need to know. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul says, all things are lawful for me. But all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. This means that just because we have free choice to do whatever it is we please does not mean that we should do it. And it doesn't mean that it is spiritually appropriate. We are faced with numerous choices every day. And if we went around doing whatever we thought that we could get away with, we would be slaves to our own desires. We should be looking to please God instead of pleasing others and ourselves. Number two, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are 
yet without sin. This is because he, uh, because he faced him. We're going to have to face him too. All we have to do is stop for a moment and examine the situations that we find ourselves in. We have to stop trying to play ignorant. Stop asking the question, what would Jesus do? Open up the word of God and study because what he did has already been written. And then last but not least, we need to understand that this world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Because it is only what you do for Christ that will last. You see, everything that looks good to you ain't always good for you. Especially if it goes against the will of God and what he stands for. The thing is, sin is sin. And just because God lets you slide today does not mean he's going to let you slide tomorrow. Grace and mercy are free gifts of God. But that does not mean that we should push the boundaries. And you better believe that any time God decides to withhold grace and mercy from us, he is just in doing so. So in closing, let us examine ourselves by asking two questions. Where is it that our desires are leading us? And are these feelings that we have, are they of God or are they of the tempter? Because everything that looks good to you ain't always good for you. And that's in more ways than one. To God be the glory for all the things that he has done. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. May we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for that word that went out, Father. We just ask right now, Father, that uh, as we sit back and we sup over the word for a little while, Father, that we just, uh, uh, just let it gurgitate in our minds, Father, what it means to be a follower of you. It means to lay down all of our selfish desires, uh, our, our wants and our cravings, Father, because you said it in your word that if anyone which is to follow after me, he is to deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow you. Father, where you went, these things are not needed. And it, that is the very same place that we desire to be. So, Father, help us to go back and look at James chapter 1. And look at these verses and understand that sometimes we just got to own our mess. But we know that we can come to you, confess and repent of it, and ask for forgiveness, and know that we are forgiven. For all these things we ask and count it done in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Like I said, you know, I, I, I did not plan on going through James like this. Uh, but, you know, the Lord has a way of dealing with us on certain things. And so... Uh, um, it looks like I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of dissecting these verses here because it's important that we stop um, uh, putting things on God that he has nothing to do with. And then we, we, we give the devil too much credit because, again, all he's doing is just throwing the stuff at us. But whether or not we choose to catch it or knock it over the fence yeah. is up to us. So, so we, we, we've got to do better about examining the situations that we're in. So uh, uh, we're going to go into our prayers of the people, but I would like to say uh, to all those who may be watching, uh, so long from Beulah Presbyterian Church of North Wilkesboro. Have a blessed day.